Hey everyone, this is Royce with RedEyeRoyce.com. I wanted to share an interview that I just recently did with Elaine Johnson. She works for the Better Coffee Group, that is B-E-T-T-R, Better Coffee Group in Singapore. And uh, the way that I got in contact with her is she, she was working on a project that she is calling the Coffee Over Corona Diaries. You can find this on my website. I've embedded a link to that. And let me show you what that looks like. So what this is, this is a user submitted uh, map. She put it together, but uh, you, if, you're, if you want to get on this map, you can submit uh, your own story. So I did this uh, with, with my son. Uh, we're in Louisville, Kentucky. I explained a little bit about how I love coffee and how it is helping me cope with the coronavirus. And as you can see, this is a worldwide project. So I, I was really impressed by this and I reached out to Elaine to talk to her about her coffee passion and about the Coffee Over Corona Diaries as well. I hope you enjoy this interview. How did you find the map, by the way? So, you know, I, I think you saw my website, redeyeroyce.com. Right. Uh, you know, I'm just, I'm a coffee enthusiast. Um, I, I, I'm not in the coffee industry by, by trade. I'm in the technology industry by trade. And I've just, I don't know, I, I really enjoy coffee. I've been a home roaster for about 10 or 11 years now. And uh, I just thought, you know, hey, like I, I, I would love to make a website and just talk to people who are in the industry, who are doing cool things, who are leaders in the industry and you know who are just advancing the coffee industry and see what they you know they think for me that like that's the medium that i love uh i i'm uh as i say a recovering seminarian uh i went to seminary in my youth so i've got lots of books and uh i don't know i just like talking to people like it, it's more real to me when i can ask somebody a question and get their opinion you know just in their own voice that yeah. More to me. So I'm like, I want to start a website that gives me like a pedestal to talk to people that I want to talk to about coffee. So that, that's what I did. And then, uh, you know, I, I've been working on that the way that, I came, you know, this is kind of a short story long, if you will. Uh, you know, part of my website, I built uh, a little RRS feed that, uh, you know, takes news articles from a number of different sites. And oh, so you have like an alert. Yeah, yeah. So, you know, I think I have like four or five different uh, feeds on my page. So then, you know, I'll just, that's as much for me as anybody else. I'll, you know, I'll just scroll through the article, see what's interesting and yours popped up. I'm like, this is a really cool project. Hey. So I just, I, I thought it was really neat. And uh, thank you for allowing me to contribute to that with my son. Uh, yeah, no, a I know. Like it's a coffee connoisseur. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's been great to see um, how, like all the different home narratives that have come out of it, like people with their pets, people with their kids. Um, oh yeah, and I wanted to share with you today that actually we crossed 50 countries today. Wow, yeah. So awesome. now we, Yeah, so as of today, we have 51 countries on the map. That's great. Cool. Yeah. So, so how did that idea come, come about? You, you mentioned that just a few minutes ago about the, the Scrudge article that kind of gave this idea but can you tell me a little bit more about your passion behind the Coffee Over Corona map? Yeah, for sure. So yeah, I saw the um, Spreadges hashtag still roasting map actually before our lockdown began. And I filled in the little uh, form underneath it um, to put our company Better, Better Coffee on the map. Um, and I was like, oh, that's cool and it's easy and it's straightforward. And I didn't think too much about it after that. But then as I, as I was at home, you know, once the lockdown started, my mom wrote to me and said, you should use your writing and capture something about what's happening right now with all your friends around the world. Cause I have, I have like a really vast network. So I've been living overseas since I was 15 um, and gone to international schools. So like, you know, I was able to get a story from like the Maldives and like just random places because I, I have these friends that um, I'm still very close with. So yeah, I just was like, okay, maybe like, I can't just write something. Um, I can't just write something like, sorry, someone just walked by. Um, that's right. I can't just write something in a sense that's already been done. Like, you know, like the daily has been doing really by uh, New York times and the take by Al Jazeera, our podcast that I listen to a lot. 
they do really strong character driven narratives, you know, like diaries from like Berlin, Tehran, Seattle. And the, and the narratives are really powerful. There was one guy who had to do a Zoom conference call for his wife's funeral. Mm, so, I mean, wow. just like really interesting stories. And I'm like, okay, so what will my take be? And I'm in mean, coffee. So I'm like, okay, let me use coffee because it's the natural starting point for everything social. And we're disconnected right now. We're socially distanced, but we still love coffee or maybe we still try to drink it. So I, just, I started from that point. And you know, when you start with like your own kind of mindset about how a project's gonna be, once you start reaching out to other people, it takes on a life of its own. So I thought, oh, it's gonna be like, maybe people will respond and say, well, coffee for me is what calms me. It's like my centering ritual. And like, for me, that's what it is. And for others, it was too. But for, for some people, it was like, I don't even have coffee in my home and I miss it. I only used to drink it at cafes when I would go meet friends and study. I have a friend in India who's in like a rural area of Gujarat right now. And because all the supply chains got disrupted, he can't actually get coffee. He can only mm. have tea. And he's originally from South India where filter coffee is like very strongly part of a culture. So the story he sent me was the contrast. One year ago, his mom basically, you know, wrecking havoc in the house because they finished all the filter coffee and there was no filter coffee left. Versus today in 2020, where he's missing even just having that fight with his mom because at least mm. was one with his family and two had coffee. So yeah, that was a little bit of where it began. And I think I had a bit of inertia in the beginning to actually start it because it's like, okay, I have to start reaching out to people. So I started a spreadsheet and I started tracking like who I've reached out to on what date, from what country, what city. And I would track it. And then suddenly like my list was at like 60, 70, 80. So now it's over a hundred um, people that have contributed. Um, and yeah, once that momentum got going, then it was really fun because it gave me a, an excuse to reach out to people that maybe I haven't spoken to in like six years who I studied with in Swaziland or I lived on a ship before. And so I'd reach out to them and stuff like this. So yeah, it's been a great point to connect like virtually over coffee, but without actually being together with coffee. Yeah, you know, that, that's inter interesting. Uh, you know, one of the things that I, I find interesting about all this is, you know, I, I work for a technology company. So we're, we're mostly remote. We, we have people across the United States, you know, we're a small, small company, uh, but I'll, I'll have Zoom meetings all the time. And with coronavirus, with, you know, all sorts of, you know, everybody kind of using Zoom or some other technology these days, in, in some ways, I, I feel like it makes the world a little smaller. Like, you know, I'm having conversations with people on the other side of the world where, you know, maybe, you know, maybe this is a shame on me, but maybe I wouldn't have, you know, had time to do that before, right? But yeah. now it's just like, this is my, my portal, portal to the world, and now I'm exploring that a little bit more. It sounds like you're maybe a little more international than I am, but, There's uh, zero that, you know, it, now. Yeah. yeah, like, yeah it's really cool. I, I, there will be people that like I've lost touch with and I'm like, well, actually they're probably at home. So why don't I just send the message and then, you know, they'll write back because it's good to connect. Um, and there's been a lot of uh, narrative going around about how, you know, we, we might be socially distant, but that might not, that doesn't mean that we're so socially disconnected. Right. Yeah. So yeah, it's, it's, there's zero barriers to entry now to basically just reach out and talk to somebody on another continent and yeah, yeah a lot of like, our like you and me you're, you're in Singapore right now and I'm in Louisville Kentucky so yeah it's really amazing yeah it's it's nice because the time difference is so easy it's just like yeah. you know just switch to a.m. p.m. there's there's sometimes we're like my family's in Seattle and so when the um daylight saving times hits I'm like is it 16 <laughs> hours is it 16 hours are they asleep are they awake so yeah East Coast yeah. is easy yeah yeah. So how did you get into coffee in the first place? Well, my story with coffee begins actually first, I guess, when I was 17. Uh, you know, Seattle's this whole coffee capital, right? I mean, Starbucks and whatever. Sure. And I was like a, you know, I, I, I had Starbucks after school every day before I'd go to work. Uh, I used to teach karate when I was a teenager. Oh, really? And then yeah, it was fun. It was fun. And so when I was 17, I was on a social justice sort of high school program to go to Guatemala. 
And I was on the coffee team, which meant that for two weeks, we were in the coffee plantations. We were learning how to dig the holes properly with the spades. We were, we were there in April, so it was the end of harvest week. So we were like just picking off some of the overripe cherries. And my Spanish was okay enough at that point where I could ask them like, how much do you get for this? Like per hour, how many hours do you work a day? And stuff like this. And I was just shocked like, okay, they can't sell directly. Like it's so rare that you meet coffee farmers who can sell directly. And that kind of piqued my interest in a lot of things that I think as Western consumers, we buy labels. We buy into labels and what they promise because it, you know, we're doing the right thing as consumers. It's fair trade, it's organic, it's direct, it's you know, all these things. So after that, I did a project later on when I was in university. So I studied um, here in Singapore at Yale and US. So Yale combined with National University of Singapore and made a liberal arts college. So I did a similar project on organic labeling for vegetables in the Philippines. Um, so I'm half Filipina, so I was kind of drawn back there. Um, so, I mean, like my, my coffee story wraps back around because when I was on that project, I was interviewing some farmers and it turned out they also farmed a little bit of coffee in their backyard. And they were like, do you want a cup of coffee? And I'm like, yeah, sure. I wasn't expecting anything like, you know, just, you know, coffee. Yeah. But oh my gosh, so this coffee, when it hit my tongue, it was just like chocolate, silken, smooth, sweet, all in one sip. You know, they don't add anything to it. And I was like, what is this elixir that you've just given me? Because it's not like any coffee I've drank before. And I was like, okay, I need to tell a story about this. So my degree was in environmental science. So I did my capstone project on um, how kind of the reclamation of coffee in the Philippines uh, is changing coffee culture and also how farmers are dealing with climate change. That was, I was also investigating that. So I'm not sure if you're aware, the Philippines was the fourth largest producer of coffee in the early 1900s. No, I, I didn't know that. Yeah, it's so cool, right? I, I didn't know that either before I started on that journey. So I learned that and I was like, so what happened to coffee? Like, how did it fall off the map? Like, everybody knows Vietnamese, Indonesian coffee, but Philippine coffee. So it turns out that coffee is so interwoven into the culture. So in the, in the north of the Philippines and Sagada, when you apply for a marriage license, you have to actually show that you have, I think it's four or five coffee trees together in your household. So this is kind of like a stipulation wow. that you are domestic together and you can grow your own coffee. So yeah, they just grow it in their backyards and, you know, they, they pulp it or they dry it naturally. And to de pulp it, actually the kids will like suck the mucilage off because it's sweet, <laughs> right? Um, and then of course the hand sort and they grind in the mortar pestle, the, the big one, right? And then they, they just roast it in a pan and they boil it on a kettle over the, over the wooden fire. So, I mean, yeah, roasters will say, okay, you don't, I mean, and you're a home roaster, so you know, you won't get yeah. that eat and roast and stuff, but maybe it's the other steps of the process that make it retain that sort of um, very rustic um, taste that's neither earthy nor acidic. It's, I don't know, it's just very balanced, but at the same time bold. Um, yeah, if I get my hands on some Philippine coffee, I'll, I'll send you some next time, but it, it was great. So that kind of started my whole like, okay, I want to be in this industry, like once I graduate. So in Singapore, we don't have coffee farms, obviously, because, you know, it's a city. Um, but I found a company here called Better Barista, which um, is a social enterprise that combines social work in a sense with coffee. So our tagline is changing lives through coffee. So how we do that is we have a two to four month vocational training program where people who are referred to us by social workers, so they come from marginalized backgrounds. So we have like our single moms, people with history of incarceration, drug use who have um, dropped out of school at a young age and things like this. So they come to us and we train them up in coffee skills, but we also do like emotional intelligence training. We work with a clinical psychologist. We take them for team building. So I get to take, I get to go with them rock climbing and hiking and stuff that like that. Well, yeah, it's great because like it, it comes back to that point of social connection we were talking about. Like a lot of those people who come into the program don't know anything about coffee or like, you know, they drink the local coffee. They're not interested, but once they get going, they see that. And I mean, anybody who, who's into coffee, it's one of those, um, 
activities, hobbies, passions, that the more you get into it, the more you realize you don't know. So it gives yeah. you this amazing <laughs> growth true. mindset. Yeah. So it empowers you with a growth mindset for life because you realize like there's always more that you can learn. Um, so, and I think that's like a very good mindset for, you know, these people in our program. And so, so yeah, I, I was like, okay, I love the company. I love the mission. I'm passionate about coffee, especially at the origin side. And I think downstream, we often don't know what actually happens upstream. Like, you know, you see pictures of farmers and like, there's some videos and whatever, but unless you've actually spent extensive time at origin. So I usually go to the Philippines twice a year now, like for the last four or five years. Um, and I'll go up there and I'll see the seedlings that I planted. Some of them grow, but actually there's about a 50% mortality rate, which is, yeah, problematic. But um, yeah, I don't know. I just kind of built my network around that for my capstone project. I spent all that time up at origin and then I came downstream to Manila and I went to 44 coffee houses. And I, I remember it was that number because Obama was the 44th president. I went to 44 coffee houses and every single time I would ask them, where does your coffee come from and do you serve Philippine coffee? And then I built a narrative around that and I made a documentary. And uh, yeah, I don't know. I just kind of took over my life because yeah, everybody I met was also passionate and interested. So yeah. It's a very yeah. important community. Yeah, no, that's that's great. Um, so uh, a couple questions come to my mind. You know, first, are, so are you, um, you know, like, what role are you playing in in better coffee? Is that are you like, you know, that you're doing some training? You know, are you like a barista? Have you have you done that part? Like, are you a coffee roaster? Like, right, you know, right. I'm not a coffee roaster. Um, I, I watch, you know, I have a couple of colleagues who are amazing roasters um, and I, and I love to cup with them whenever they're doing, whenever they're cupping the coffees. Um, so I'm most, I am, I'm in, I do marketing and brand communication, but I also do a lot of the, cause I do a lot of this storytelling. So that's why the map came naturally yeah. to me. And, We're good and at it, so. Yeah, I do the videography, um, like our reporting, like our annual report. Um, anything that has to do with an environmental initi initiative or sustainability metric, I normally take that up. But um, I'm also doing a little bit of product innovation. So we are, have these coffee face scrub. So we do that for kind of coffee appreciation workshops. Okay. How you can get coffee scrub from your coffee grounds. And actually just last night, I prototyped this coffee soap. It's in the kitchen. But, you know, you melt down the shea butter base and then you yeah. mix in the coffee grounds. So yeah, these are all kind of like zero waste things that I'm trying to bring into effect. Um, and it's, it's hard because Singapore is, uh, how, how would I, let's say, okay, for example, at university for our recycling and our trash chutes, they're separate. But when you go to the bottom, it's the same bin. Mm -hmm. So there is no, there isn't really the same inculcated sense of um, uh, mindfulness about consumption. So I'm trying to bring that into the into the company as well. That's really cool. I, I really like that. And uh, th there's a couple of products that I've kind of seen. I don't have access to. I, I think these are. I guess one of them is like a German-made product that hasn't made it to the U U.S. yet. And it's um, it's um, drinkware made out of uh, coffee grounds. Happy, happy form. Yeah, that is so cool. I, 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 I think it's really neat. Yeah, Berlin. I only see that on the internet. I'm like, how do I get this? When is it going to make it to me? You know? Yeah, no, it's and they, they do all around the EU. They ship, yeah, not to the US. No, Cappy Form has been a huge inspiration for mine for the last few years because when I saw that, I was like, man, this is a this is a, a raw material that can become a composite material. I love that. Yeah, you know, I even I even said to my boss once, I'm like, if you can make coffee saucers and tables you can make coffee houses and she's like okay well maybe i'm yeah. like, okay. like bricks you know you can make coffee bricks exactly exactly yeah. and i think it's been done so i think that's what also intrigues me about coffee is that you know it's something that's so essential to supply chains to our lives to so many countries but it's actually like a very wasteful product there was one study that showed that only six percent of the original biomass of the cherry makes it into your cup so like the oh, wow. pulp and the mucilage and you know the the silver skin and everything else that you lose along the way 
is just a waste product. It's not even a byproduct that you that is generally used. I mean, some people make cascara tea and stuff like this, but all the solutions I found are not happening at scale. So there was one in San Diego where they use the coffee ink or the coffee um, grounds and they make it into ink and then oh, they cool. print onto t-shirts. Okay, yeah, then cool. you wear a t-shirt with like, you know, a screen print of a French press of the coffee that you've just served like to your That's customers. That's really cool. That's amazing. But yeah. it's in San Diego. Yeah. Well, there, there's a, a shoe company as well. I think it's Renz. Have you seen them? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The waterproof and they jump yeah. in. Yeah, 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 yeah. That's so cool. Awesome. Have you tried well, it? I, I haven't yet. Yeah. I, I, uh, I want to, but I haven't. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Those, those shoes look awesome and they're stylish. So. Yeah. Yeah, they're pretty cool. I, I, I'm debating, I'm like, which one I want, like, there, there's part of me that I'm like, okay, I'll just like do like a nice brown, you know, I don't stand out in a crowd, then I'm like, I also really like, like, the bright blue ones that have, like, the yellow on them, I'm like, that's really cool, you know, yeah. eye-popping kind of colors. So. Yeah, I mean, the fact that your shoes are made of coffee is just, like, the most fantastic conversation. so starter. cool. Yeah. Yeah, I'm like, I just want everything to be made out of coffee, this is great. I saw, actually, um, uh, uh, sunglasses. The rim was made out of coffee. Yeah. That was cool. And I think not just sunglasses, but you can get any lenses put in. So the glasses were made out of coffee, and then there was a mask, like a face mask. Oh, okay. With coffee. I'm like, that sounds pretty nice, actually, if it's aromatic. Yeah, that, that sounds all right. There's also coffee sheets. So they make the linen with some coffee grounds, not fully. Um, not so much that it smells like coffee or is caffeinated, but yeah, there's so many applications. Yeah. Well, that, that's fantastic. That's really cool that you're trying to develop those products as well. Uh, you know, the soap and, and whatnot. That's, that's really neat. I, I have a friend, I, actually a guy that I think did my, maybe my second interview uh, on my website. Uh, he actually owns a coffee farm and, uh, you know, I think he's taking the bags and they're making like aprons and purses and, you know, out of the, like the giant burlap bags, you know, they're trying yeah. to make products out of that and reduce the waste on that. And, you it's know, he sells the cascara and, and yeah. 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 We, we did some workshops in March for the jute sacks. Um, yeah. yeah. So we partnered with them because I mean, we don't have like really good, um, sewing skills. So we partnered with another social enterprise here who loved the idea and the class was sold out. Um, so everybody made their own tropical, what do they call it? A bucket bag. So they okay. lined it. And then, yeah, the outside was from the, I think the coffee sack. I can't remember. I think it was like Cafe de Las, which is a program by Olam. So, right, Cafe de Las is like coffee of hers, right? So that's a program that supports and invests back in women farmers where they operate. So that kind of logo or like, you know, kind of the side face of the woman was on those bags. So it looked, it looked really nice, you know, and again, yeah. great conversation starter. And then you can say, oh, well, I did it myself. I did this workshop and, you know, then you can talk about sustainability and coffee and all these things. So, yeah, yeah. that's great. So, uh, in your opinion, uh, you know, what's the way forward? Like, you know, how, uh, how should the coffee culture be growing oh, in your, in your mind? That's a big question. It is. Um, so, I mean, we kind of have two, two, two industries, even within coffee, you have the commodity coffee, right? And then you have specialty coffee and they're very distinct, right? Um, you know, I've had a lot of conversations about this. There is a woman named Trish Rothgub who uh, sort of basically coined the term third wave coffee 20, something, 20 so years ago. And I asked her the same question. And, you know, the truth is that we need to be more prepared to pay more for specialty coffee. And, you know, people already like have a, you know, have issues paying like six dollars you know seven dollars for a latte but if you look at all the different ways f and prices have increased over the last 20 years with inflation and all this coffee has not followed suit which is why it's such a profitable industry for you know certain people in it certain stakeholders along the supply chain um so yeah I it's think not, we, it, you mean it's not growing out like the the farmer level 
Is that what you mean? Because, you know, you, you go to the grocery store and it's, you know, you know, 13 to 16 bucks a bag, right? Right, right. Yeah, but even at like a, a cafe as well, like we're not paying, what, what we pay might still seem like a lot, but it's still not reflecting the true value or the cost of production to the farmers. And to be perfectly straight from what I've seen at the farms and what I've seen at Origin is that we can't expect people to keep um, going down cycles of poverty or basically um, losing money every year because it, coffee is such a high risk crop. It's so finicky like especially Arabica, Arabica Typica, you know, the farmers who I would talk to, they'd be like, it's like my third child, you know, you have to come out and care for it and make sure it's okay every day, check on it. It's not, you know, as hardy as Robusta. Um, so I, I think that to make coffee more resilient as an industry going forward, we need to empower coffee farmers with other means of revenue so that if, mm. you know, some coffee trees die or they get leaf rust, they're not gonna give up growing coffee because so often what I see is that like, you know, the average age of a farmer in the Philippines is 57. I think it's similar in the US. You know, agri it's, it's a hard sell to make agriculture sexy, to get people mm -hmm. back on the farms, to get the kids out of the city onto the farms doing this. Because um, coffee isn't really something that I feel, at least specialty coffee, that you can mass produce. Um, it, it, like it's really the small holders and it's really the micro lots that are pushing the industry forward in terms of quality. And so besides paying more and making sure farmers have alternative um, revenue streams, I think it's also having more of that engagement and direct um, relationships between roasters and farmers, that farmers get the immediate feedback of what was good about my coffee, what was the defect. So one of our partners um, in Nicaragua is Gold Mountain Coffee Growers. Um, so uh, their founder, Ben, they actually have their roast, some of their roasters come to Nicaragua and cup the coffee with the farmers. And so, yeah, it totally increases the value of the product for the farmer because they're seeing one, like, wow, the roaster loves it. Two, like, you know, this is why it's so unique when they're telling them the flavor profiles and the tasting notes and all these things. And it allows them, if they get that feedback, they can up their points by a lot, like even just within a year. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, sometimes like by 10 points on the, on the specialty scale, which is huge and it can make a big difference for your income. Yeah. So, yeah, what about you? Like, I mean, I mean, you're a roaster. I mean, what, what do you think about moving the industry forward? Oh man, I get to answer this question. Uh, I, I'm usually the one asking this question. I don't usually have to answer this. <laughs> well, you know, as far as moving the, the industry forward, you know, I, I'm, I'm looking at trends, I'm reading, uh, I'm reading articles about how unsustainable it is for for farmers and you know how endangered the coffee trade is because farmers are not getting what what they need out of it to, to make it worth their while you know they've got families they've got children they've got people that rely on this uh you know to sustain themselves and at the end of the day if we don't pay more for the the raw product uh yeah it's going to incentivize people going elsewhere so you know i, I definitely agree um that there needs to be, you know, I, I'd love to see more direct trade with, with farmers. Uh, you know, I, I'm not the one in charge of figuring out how that, you know, how that goes, but like, you know, how can we have direct trade with the farmers? And, you know, I love it. Uh, you know, I about buy most of my products, uh, most of my green beans from Sweet Maria's. Uh, I don't know if you're familiar with them. They're a company out in sure, California. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, you know, I've been buying from them for like 10 years. And they kind of do the same thing. They go to micro lots and, you know, taste the coffee with, with the growers and then bring back those micro lots. And, you know, I, I think that it is that focus on, on quality, the focus on the uniqueness of the coffee, not just, you know, I need something sugary and caffeinated. Uh, you know, it has to be a focus on re a really qu quality drink is going to help, uh, you know, drive the price up for the farmers and, hopefully make it sustainable for them. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm from a small town in Southern Kentucky and, you know, I, I grew up in kind of an agricultural town. My, my father, you know, he was, when he was a boy, he grew up on a farm raising cattle and everything. And, um, you know, kind of through that lens, like it, you know, 
he's not a farmer now because uh, you know they found an easier way to make money. So yeah, and you're in tech, <laughs> which I'm is like tech. pretty far flung away from agriculture. It huh? is. Well, actually, uh, not too long ago, not super long ago, I was in agriculture. I was a, a certified arborist, and I, oh. I ran a tree care company oh. for a number of years. Oh, so, nice. Yeah, and then I made the jump, jump to tech. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Very so, cool. Yeah. yeah, no, it's, you're, you're, you absolutely hit the nail on the head, and I think, you know, for the people who are producing our coffee, there has to be it's not just passion. It's like, you know, you have to, it has to be a business and it has to be a lucrative business at the end of the day. So that's why I think like a lot of the people that we partner with from Better Barista have similar um, values and missions to make sure that like, this is a livelihood. It's not just something that you're stuck in because your parents did it and whatever. So one of our partners um, in Kenya is Baba Specialty Coffee. So yeah, they do a lot of training programs around agronomy and stuff, financial literacy. So it's not just like growing coffee. It's also like knowing how to make coffee your business, which is, I think, very powerful and agricultural. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, but you know, this whole pandemic, like the way that it has um, torn the cover off of a lot of underlying issues, it's done the same in a sense with coffee because there's already a lot of volatility, right? And uncertainty for, for growers. And there was an example I heard of when um, basically a Norwegian company said to a grower in, in Africa that I, I, I can't take the risk on this shipment. Um, mm. like, can you either give me ins buy, buy insurance that it's going to come or like I need to cancel the contract. And it's like, this is a huge contract. This is like 400 farmers lives that could be impacted. And it's like, they've already put in all the work. It's been harvested. So in a place like Norway, where you have six months of, um, uh, you know, the government's going to cover your employment for six months should, should anything happen with the pandemic. You have all these securities and safety nets. And, you know, in many countries in Africa, there's no, like, whatever stimulus budget is going to get rolled out. So I think that for all the talk and the lip service that goes on about, like, having these direct relationships and caring about your growing communities, uh, when a crisis comes out, when it comes down to it, is there still humanity along the supply chain? Are you still as a human looking and seeing what one, the position of privilege you might be in and two, how it could impact hundreds of people's, of, hundreds of people's lives who have already put in all the work to, to grow this coffee. So, I mean, that was a bit disheartening, but mm. I mean, yeah, I, I think as well, what, co what coffee farmers experience, um, that uncertainty, they experience that on a yearly basis. We're experiencing it now as a global whole, but they, they experience it every year, that, that sort of uncertainty, unless they have like very like reliable buyers. So. Yeah. And, you know, uh, to me, this kind of goes back to, in, in some ways, the, the emphasis on, on quality and not being, you know, co coffee is a commodity, right? But, but not allowing yourself to be commoditized because, you know, on one hand, you can say, well, shoot, I, I, you know, I, I'm in a pinch right now. I'll just buy cheaper coffee. Like, you know, that's an easy way to trim my budget. But, yeah. you know, for, for somebody like, like me, like, I just, I, I love coffee. You know, I, I just love the flavors. And, you know, what got me in was I had a friend who was a home roaster. And he uh, roasted up some Ethiopian coffee for me. And I swear, I, I've never been able to, like, I've been so frustrated for like 10 years. I've been trying to re replicate this, but I can't. Uh, like, it tasted like I was drinking blueberry juice. Like, yeah, it, yeah, like, yeah. So striking. You know, like, it, it even tastes like coffee. And, you know, I, I have family members who are kind of wine snobs. And they're like, oh, do you t taste the subtle hint of this? And I'm like, it tastes like wine to me. Like, I just taste wine. Yeah. But, you know, that was like the first time with coffee where I'm just like, oh, my gosh, like, it's, it's unmistakable. This is fabulous. And that's when I really fell in love with, you know, just, you know, kind of single origin, just really great coffee. You know, and, and to that point, I'd been kind of like, you know, Folgers, Maxwell House, you know, whatever, whatever there is. But, you know, it was at that point that I really fell in love with it. I think getting people to fall in love with that and connecting them to people that can give them that sort of quality 
bean and, and even quality roast, like better coffee. Um, you know, I, I, I would think that that would help stabilize the, the coffee environment and incentivize people to, uh, you know, pay more for, for those beans. So that's kind of what, I, yeah. what I'm seeing a little bit. Yeah, I, th I think for the, for the real diehard, hardcore coffee lovers um, in a pandemic, they are more incensed to support us. And we've definitely gotten that, um, people who are ordering our beans and stuff. We, we have eight retail outlets that we had to close for the last uh, two months, but we still have our roastery. So we're hashtag still roasting, going strong with that, you know, mailing out all our different products. We have new products, but um, on the whole, for the, for the general public, coffee is not recession proof. Um, you know, people are going to go forgo their $6 latte at their neighborhood cafe for $2 Dunkin' Donut coffee. And yep. that's the reality of it. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, I, I think a struggle for me as well is like, it's, it's obvious when I talk to people in the industry and the way that I view coffee is it's like, it's so obvious. It's like that social point of connection. You start with it. It's a gateway. But for a lot of people, it's like, well, I drink it when I need caffeine or, you know, if I'm tired or, you know, it's yeah. not really something that you think about more deeply. And so I, want that mindfulness to accompany every cup of coffee especially once you see the work that goes into it you know because it's so it's like even more complex than wine like wine okay there's a lot about it you know to be a wine sommelier and all these things but wine once it's in the bottle like you're good right i mean you can let it age for however long and you know aerate it and stuff like this but with coffee like it doesn't stop not at one point of the since the, when you plant the seedling until it gets to your lips and even as it cools it there are all these variables and factors that can affect the quality right mm -hmm. and that's why i think being a barista is actually um a huge responsibility because it's now upon your shoulders that if all this effort has gone into producing a quality coffee the right environmental practices you know it was harvested at the right time dried process them the, the right way, transported efficiently with the right conditions and roasted just to the right degree. Um, and then as a barista, you're the one pouring out the drink and preparing this drink. You're, a, you're essentially the gatekeeper of, you know, quality coffee. Um, I mean, people make the argument that like, well, so is the roaster, so is the producer and everything. But yeah, no, I, th I think being a barista, so I've done some barista classes with Better Barista but I wouldn't call myself a barista. I can, I can make coffee and stuff, but um, they're, you know, I'm not, I'm not a professional at it in the way that a lot of my colleagues are who have won many awards and who are international judges and these things. Um, have you been to a coffee competition? I have not, I would love to, but I have not. I, I think I've been watching an online coffee competition, but uh, I haven't been to one, no. They're so fun. There's one that, um, a movie, uh, I watched it online, it's called The Coffee Man. Uh, it's about Sasha Sestik, who won okay. the 2015 Worlds in Seattle. Um, so yeah, I saw that and it was like, yeah, an amazing sort of um, atmosphere because it's a lot of showmanship, but it's also like so much passion. You know, people don't, don't, don't sleep, don't eat. And you'll see people, there was this one guy who came out with a big ice block and then he like prepares his coffee like from within the ice block and something like this. Mm. So very creative. Um, but yeah, I went to a, my first coffee competition in March, actually right as the pandemic hit. And um, yeah, there's so much pride to it. I mean, of course, part of it is the showmanship of it. They come up and they're like, you know, this coffee was prepared and it's going to blow your mind and da, da, da. Yeah, And then yeah. you, know, you talk to the judges and it's like, so how was it really? They're like, yeah, it was, it was okay. It was average. But yeah, you really have to believe in, in the product and in, and in your beverage. So it's, it's really fun. Yeah. So um, I, I think we maybe kind of cover, covered this. Uh, you don't have to answer this if you don't want to, if you feel like it's redundant. But, you know, I, I do try to ask people, you know, you talked about third wave. You know, to you, what is fourth wave? What is that going to be? Or are we in it already? Who knows? No, no, I love this question because when I was doing my capstone research, I asked the same question to people. It was also like, you know. Well, um, I guess I'm behind the times then. Sorry, I didn't answer. Um, no, yeah, I, um, 
you know, these waves of coffee, uh, the way I think of them is that it's not so much about the production of coffee, it's more about how the consumer is interacting with coffee, right? So a second wave, it's like kind of mass consumed. You have like a big jar of folders on the table and you make your coffee in the morning, whatever. Um, but specialty coffee is about like the presentation and the present, you know, um, the, the quality and, you know, the barista will do an elaborate presentation and really like be earnest to teach you and share with you their craft because it's really, I think, third wave coffee is about craftsmanship. So fourth wave coffee for me is really that engagement with what happens before the barista, right? Um, so, you know, you hear all these terms like bean the cup, seed the cup, um, bean the bar. Yeah, all these, all these different terms that like, I think are beginning to kind of percolate into what a fourth wave could be. Uh, but the reality, I think, of why I, I would say we're not quite there yet is simply like our geographical limitations. Like unless you live in a country like the Philippines where you take a bus and overnight you're in a coffee producing region from the city. In the U.S., you know, we have to fly down to Guatemala or Nicaragua to really get that, that, that connection and that reality. So, yeah, I would, I would hope that it's less just about like, oh, this coffee is fantastic, right? but more about the who made it fantastic and why. So mm -hmm. that, would, that would be fourth wave to me. Yeah, that, that, that's really cool. Uh, you know, I, I think I've uh, seen some com companies are kind of trying to move in that direction. You know, I, I can think of a couple of cafes that I've gone to where, you know, it has pictures of like the farmer on the wall. It's like, th no, this is not just like a stock photo. Like this is the actual person, you know, that grew the stuff that we're, you know, doing today. We're, you know, we're, so you know, making dedications and supporting to that person. Uh, you know, I, I don't think I ever, I, I, I'm kind of debating my head, like, is that third wave? Is that fourth wave? Like, you know, what it exactly is that? But, you know, it is interesting to see it uh, kind of moving in that direction uh, because, you know, unless the coffee is sustainable for the people growing it, we're not going to have that product. And, you know, I, I think what what's the trade value of coffee right now? Isn't it like $1.30 a pound or something like that? Like, uh, you know, it's, it's yeah. pretty low. <laughs> I think the price is lower too, but yeah, yeah no, and, and there's cool, like, especially uh, digital solutions that are coming about for this. So there's one app called Farmer Connect, or no, no, it's called mm -hmm. Thank, Thank My Farmer. So basically, Let's say like, that again, you, you kind of cut out a little bit. Oh, I was saying there's really cool digital solutions. So one that I really like, it's called Thank My Farmer. Okay. It's, awesome. it's kind of a product of Farmer Connect. So basically how it works is it's an app. So, okay, you have your coffee on the blockchain, you have a QR code, you can scan it, boom, you get all the information about the farm, where it was at, what time, all these things. Think My Farmer takes it one step further. So you see all that info about the farmer, and then you can actually choose to send them a certain amount directly to them. Oh, that's awesome. Here on the blockchain, like, you know, you're having your coffee and it's like, wow, this is a great cup. Like, I want to send them five bucks, what I just paid for it, boom, and you can send it back. So, I mean, yeah, there's- That's cool, really cool. Yeah, so there's cool technological solutions that are collapsing the supply chain in a sense. Um, well, I, I like that because, you know, it's customary to tip your barista, but, you know, how do you tip the farmer? Like, that's, that's a really cool innovation. Yeah, exactly, exactly. So, I mean, yeah, I mean, put blockchain to use like that. I mean, I, I think that's fantastic, so get them visibility. And because you're not always just con um, contributing directly back to the farmer, you can also choose community projects in like say whatever village in, in Nicaragua, you can like send five bucks for like the clean water project, you know, piping project in the school of the community they're in, so. Fantastic. Yeah. Well, I, I've had you on here for a while, so maybe I'll just ask you one more question and then I'll let you go. Sure, no you worries. Know, What's, what's next for you personally? Like, what are you, you working on? Where are you growing? And uh, what's, what's going on with Elaine? Yeah, so um, I've been in Singapore for six years, uh, which is, has been a while. Um, so I'll definitely be with Better Barista for the next, next probably two years um, because I have a working bond in Singapore. So basically my university was free, given that I worked for a, in Singapore for three years after. Um, so I've, I've, been, I've been working with Better Barista for almost a year now. Wow, it, it goes fast, it goes fast. Um, 
but I'm really fascinated by coffee research because that's kind of, you know, I come from that academic background. So I read an article, I think it was in um, Perfect Daily Grind, can't remember, but it was about how 47 of the coffee species, wild coffee species are found only in Madagascar. And you know, the ones that we mm -hmm. grow on a commercial basis are like basically like Arabica and like Robusta. Yeah. Enough for, right? So, I mean, if we want to talk about increasing the resilience of coffee, genetically speaking, you need to go do all this um, genetic research at origin. And I, so I don't know, like I would love to basically get a Fulbright or something and go do some research on the ground in Madagascar of like, I mean, I'm not a plant, you know, geneticist or anything like this, but um, yeah, that research needs to, you know, start in earnest. And so I've been in touch with the World Coffee, yeah, World Coffee Research Institute, um, attending their seminars and stuff. And so getting more interested in like, okay, how can we like push forward this research in the industry? Because the reality is that this research is usually funded on a national level. So in a lot of like coffee growing, coffee producing countries, you know, besides Brazil, aren't investing a lot into um, coffee research. Mm. So, so yeah, that's kind of what I'm looking at in the future. Madagascar. Yeah. Yeah, that sounds like a really awesome project. That sounds really cool. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks again so much for reaching out. Um, yeah. I, I'm glad that this map was able to find just like people from all corners of the world. And, yeah. and it resonates with people. So yeah, I've gotten great feedback and it's like, I, I didn't know that this like little idea that came out during like sleepless pandemic nights was gonna like, you know, connect me with so many people. So yeah, it's been a well, it was really cool. I, I thought it was really cool. I know I've been blessed by, you know, reading other people's uh, entries. You know, it's just cool to see how people are dealing with that and interacting with, with coffee. And, you know, it makes me feel more connected with, you know, people across the globe. So it's, it's a yeah. really neat project that you came up with. Yeah, it helps build a little bit of solidarity. And we need that now. So yeah, very yeah. good. Well, thank you again for your time. I uh, hope you have a great Saturday evening there in uh, Singapore. And uh, stay in touch. Okay, yeah, thanks so much. And yeah, reach out if anything. All right. Thanks, Elaine. Okay, bye.